for giving me an opportunity to share with you some of the results we have been able to achieve over the last six years with the Private Sector Development Initiative, which is a co-finance initiative with OSAID, and recently we also got NZAID involved, so for the next six years to come. Now, uh, the... Oops. So it's going on its own. Um, this is a bit of a problem. <laughs> it's, uh, so I can't refer to it. Um, it's, let me see if I can go. No, this is going forward. Uh, Andrew, you were saying how much you like and promise your talk. <laughs> yes, okay, great. Now, uh, let's leave this aside. And I keep, uh, keep talking whilst maybe you give me a hand on this. Uh, I didn't realize that it was animated. This was not the intention. So, uh, the private sector... <laughs> okay, fine. I scroll down with this. Fine. Great. Uh, the Private Sector Development Initiative, as I said, is a cooperation between now between three partners. It's ADB, it's OSAID, and uh, NZAID program. It has been in operations for the last six years. It's in its third phase, and the third phase is going to have another six years to come. Now, on this specifically, we had focused for the last, uh, for the last two phases on only three areas, and this, uh, these are also the areas which I would like to show some results we have achieved in the context of economic empowerment of women, which is not an explicit objective of the program, which is important to note. It's not explicit. But uh, sometimes it's better not to have explicit objectives, but you're approaching it, what I heard before, like saying everybody's equal, and then we have a look at what the results are like, and at the end of the day, we see that women are, by, by default, uh, empowered more than men are. So, having said that and put that up front, uh, I'm, um, I'm not so much a friend of, um, positive discrimination. I've never been, but I've learned that sometimes it's necessary to do so, to, to achieve results. Having said that, uh, we, we have attempted in the context of the Private Sector Development Initiative to put together a flowchart to show a, a cause-effect relationship. This is only a snapshot. And it basically looks at uh, legal structures, what Peter had mentioned, and we go into some details on that. Uh, it looks at access to finance, which is absolutely critical, and that in turn has uh, quite a bearing on, and, uh, on, the, on the ownership of land and prevents women from having access to finance, which is critical, and we have some solutions there as well. And also the, uh, the, the heavy burden on women uh, and the demand on time on women, which basically disadvantages them in the context of becoming economically active in the sense of, of uh, increasing their, their economic power and earning, earning capacity to the fullest. Okay, and at the end of the day, we have, and um, that was mentioned earlier, we have a situation that a lot of women, if they need urgently to find a resource and, and earn some money, they resort to vegetable sellers going into markets, staying in the informal sector, which is characterized by low productivity and relatively low income, leading to uh, unmet potential and really not using it to the fullest. The first area uh, the private sector development initiative is focusing on is business law reform. And here we, we found, um, on the one hand, we have a lot of restrictions. Uh, the legal environment is absolutely not conducive to, uh, to women uh, entering, entering private businesses. And we had uh, just recently an assessment done in the Solomon Islands. And I don't know if you're aware of it, the Business, the business Names Act uh, stipulates that you have to have your husband's <coughs> name on it. So you have to, to basically name your husband. So what do you do if you're not married? The Business Names Act basically prevents you from registering. I mean, it's all those little things which are absolutely critical, and you, you sometimes wonder in disbelief how come. Now, these are all quite, uh, quite old legislations, and we are hoping that uh, through uh, collaboration with the respective uh, governments that we will be able to, to help this along and redress the situation. Now, uh, we have issues with regards to, to the burden of, of workload, and we have issues with um, 
business structures and the type of business women can actually uh, register. So we have uh, the need in, in some of the countries that you have, you have to have at least two people and it has to be your husband or your brother to open a business. And we felt that maybe we need to look and help governments to, to find a different uh, legal structure for a business to actually have help uh, in setting up enterprises. And uh, what we have done in the Solomon Islands are two things. We have um, helped institute a, a single proprietorship, so a single, um, a single company registry. So you don't need to have your husband. You can just go and register. That, that basically helps you to, to go ahead and, and progress. You don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to have a signature. You, you basically are, if you like, empowered to, to set, set up a formal business. We also tried to incorporate the, the culture into, into the legal setup of a company and uh, set up um, a, a community company legislation. So a group of women can register a company and by doing so uh, it doesn't have to have yet again doesn't have to have the signature of a male member it can be a group of women a women's group who, who registers and uh, and basically by doing so ensuring that uh, the the setup is sufficiently transparent to see where the resources are going and giving them the power over the resources they have earned in this in this company okay what, uh, what has happened in the Solomon Islands through these two aspects, uh, in particular, we have now 825 female directors registered companies. And these are 25% up since we started uh, in December 2010, up to last month. So this is really tangible. So we are seeing an increase just by changing the, uh, the different legal options you have in registering a company. Uh, we have 867 registered female shareholders as well. And this is through the community company in particular. So up by 19%. And these, these type of legislative changes are critical for helping women to take the next step. So I have only five, four minutes, four minutes left. I better hurry up. Access to finance. Um, we all know that only 5% of the land is owned by women or together with their husbands, which basically makes it impossible to go to a commercial bank and try to, to get a loan. So what have we done about that? We have started in 2006 to roll out a program on secure transaction reforms. Secure transaction reforms basically helps anybody, male as well as female, to use movable property uh, as collateral collateral to secure loans. This is quite something unique uh, in, in, in a lot of areas. Uh, Australia only um, introduced this two years ago. Two years ago, one and a half years ago. This is relatively new in this part of the world. In the Pacific, uh, this has already spread to six countries and it does make a difference. I will not go into some of those details here, but what we have, unfortunately you can see that, uh, with what we have with secure transaction reforms, it led to, it's on the bottom and it's hidden, um, we have about 500 new loans uh, addressed and uh, made available to women using secure transaction, um, secure transaction registries. This is commercial banks providing loans to women who have no access to land or house or something which, which normally is being used as collateral, which is absolutely critical. We have also worked with uh, Microbank Nationwide to use uh, mobile uh, money transfers and MyCash, the introduction of MyCash, which led to over 4,000 new bank accounts being held by women. And this is exclusively the mobile technology. So it's, it's really a step forward. It takes some time, but we are quite positive that this is leading into the right direction. And the last area I would like to share with you uh, is, and Susan, you mentioned that, is the issue on SOEs. Uh, SOEs are, are dominated, the board of directors of SOEs is do, are dominated by men, but in comparison to certain parts of the world, it's actually in the Pacific pretty good, I have to say. <coughs> this is a, a big compliment. Uh, we have been training uh, women as well as men uh, to uh, 
to increase their, their capabilities and their know-how on how to, to manage SOEs, be an effective member of a board. We have increased, by doing so, we have increased the pool, the pool of, um, of uh, potential members for SOEs, and we have seen an increase in uh, SOE board members to 16%, which is quite remarkable. We should maybe have a look what is happening in Australia. I don't have the figures. I know in, in Europe it is appalling. In my home country it's a disaster. And uh, so I'm quite embarrassed. And I think 16% is good, but there is plenty of room for improvement and we shouldn't just stop there. Okay, and that leaves me to, uh, to conclude that there is substantial progress made. It is not sufficient yet. There is plenty more which needs to be done. And we are going to monitor that very closely and we are picking up on legal issues to progress it. We are picking up on the SOE reforms and progress women's involvement in it. And we will make an emphasis on uh, access to finance and helping women to access uh, financial services, not only loans. Thank you.